Okay, so we're we're live now. All right, uh, welcome everyone to our our third uh, faculty lecture uh, presentation. Um, as you guys know, uh, uh, Carol is going to be speaking today on his uh, research in Africa. So I'm going to pass the floor, uh, um, pass the mic, so to speak, and uh, and let the presentation begin. All right. Thank you, Brian. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to sharing some of my research with you and to the discussion about it during the Q and A. Uh, let me see if I can close my slides. Yes, right. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a theme of my book manuscript that I'm currently exploring and might spin off as a journal article. It is very much work in progress and I'll appreciate any feedback that you might have, uh, especially on the theoretical approach that I will discuss uh, in the talk. Um, so the theme of the manuscript that I'll address today concerns the reasons why some states seeking to increase their capacity to govern rural areas away from centers of power prioritize the buildup of the military and police, while others establish civilian state structures responsible for provision of public goods such as education, healthcare, roads. Now argue that the development of these two distinct types of state capacity is the government of is the result of government pursuit of political strategies intended to either subjugate local populations or gain popular legitimacy. Now I'll attribute the adoption of these two strategies to two factors: one, elite vulnerability to societal pressure, and two, co-optation of local elites. And specifically, I'll argue that public goods provision and the related redistributive capacity of the state increase with elite vulnerability to state pressure, uh, while government reliance on repression and investment in the coercive capacity of the state uh, reflect national political elites' ability to co-opt local power brokers. Um, and I'll also discuss the uh, mixed method study that underlies my larger book project and which I conducted to uh, take advantage of substantial cross-national and subnational variation in the presence of all these variables of interest uh, in the uh, dryland region that straddles the borders of Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda. This study provides broad support for my argument, uh, but I'm at the moment exploring what my argument might be missing as well as more generally ways to uh, refine this argument. Um, and I'll start with an empirical puzzle. So since the start of the 21st century, the governments of Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda have greatly expanded their capacity to govern the previously neglected arid borderland region that is known as the drylands. But the kinds of local state bodies that have been established in different parts of this dryland region vary considerably. And this is even though the drylands are very much a single region that is inhabited by the same ethnic groups, uh, and even though the three countries share similar overall levels of state capacity, economic development, and many other characteristics. So for example, uh, the Kenyan section of the drylands has seen the construction of new hospitals, schools and roads, including this gleaming, gleaming new uh, tarmac highway that's pictured uh, on the left, um, and it connects Marsabit in northern Kenya with the rest of the country. But in contrast, across the Ugandan border to the west, uh, public service provision has been very limited. And instead, the Ugandan government has deployed in its section of the drylands, which is known as Karamoja, uh, very large numbers of soldiers who have brutally repressed uh, Karamoja's population. So in other words, the two governments, Kenyan and Ugandan, have invested in distinct types of state capacity. And interestingly, Ethiopia has seen both repression and public goods provision by the government all at the same time. But perhaps even more surprising has been the substantial subnational variation across the Dwellan region. So this road in Marsabit, uh, that's in a picture, it might look impressive, but in fact, public service provision in 
most of it has lagged behind neighboring Turkana to the west. In Uganda, Amudat has experienced less repression and somewhat more public goods provision than Moroto to the north. And uh, both kinds of the Ethiopian government's local capacity are higher in Borena than in Nyangatom to its west. This brings me to uh, the research question that I'll address today. So what explains the variation in the development of local state capacity in places like the drylands of Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda? Um, and the existing scholarship shows the importance of this question. So uh, an absolutely massive literature in economics, political science, sociology, and adjacent disciplines has extensively documented the strong impacts of state capacity on economic growth and development, on public goods provision, on democratization, absence of conflict, and many other important phenomena. However, this literature cannot really account for the variation in the types of state capacity uh, that we observe in the drylands, because this literature tends to conceive of states' ability to perform all their functions as a kind of singular variable or a factor with different values along a continuum from weak to strong state capacity. So in contrast to most scholars of this topic, I uh, disaggregate state capacity and distinguish between its types. Um, in addition, work on the uh, development of state capacity has largely focused on processes unfolding at the centers of state power and on national political elites. Um, and I emphasize the importance of local elites and focus on state capacity development at the local level. But the same literature has also primarily investigated historical state building processes. And in contrast, uh, contributions addressing contemporary state capacity development of the sort that I investigate in the drylands have been quite limited. Um, more broadly, there also exists a substantial and quite rapidly growing literature on the unevenness of state territorial reach and subnational variation in state capacity. And this literature has shown that state capacity is generally highest in areas close to the centers of political power, uh, such as capital cities and in other strategically important areas, um, but it diminishes away from such centers of power. Um, and uh, the mostly rural areas outside of centers of power um, are commonly referred to in this literature as political peripheries, and I adopt this uh, terminology in my talk. But unlike my research, um, most contributions to this unevenness uh, literature have investigated variation in the level of state capacity in different subnational areas. And scholars within this strand of the literature have been really considered variation in the types of state capacity. And for this reason, they haven't really addressed the reasons why governments employ varied state capacity building strategies across their territories. <clears throat> My research um, addresses these gaps in our understanding of state capacity and its development at the local level in those political peripheries, those rural areas. Uh, located outside the centers of political power. And uh, I articulate a theory that attributes the development of what I call coercive and redistributive state capacity, uh, respectively, to two factors. So elite vulnerability to societal pressure and balance of power between uh, national and local political elites. And I use the term national political elites to refer to the political agents who operate are those centers of state power and jointly control central government bodies and uh, local political elites meanwhile operate at the local level away from the centers of power and occupy leadership positions within those local populations. And I argue that elite vulnerability to societal pressure incentivizes elites to provide populations with public goods and services, and that cooptation of weak local elites by their national counterparts removes key constraints on government use of coercion. 
Um, and the strategies of public goods provision and repression, respectively, represent the primary ways in which governments that seek to increase their local capacity to govern can engage with the populations of political peripheries. So one, governments can gain local support and legitimacy by providing goods and services that local people benefit from, or two, they can subjugate such populations and so quash any local opposition. And governments that rely on the first strategy, that of legitimacy building, well, they need to invest in the redistributive state apparatus that's capable of redistributing government resources to populations through public goods provision. Um, and the choice of the second strategy, uh, that of subjugation, uh, on the other hand, necessitates investment in the coercive apparatus of the state that's made up of government bodies such as the military and police and paramilitary organizations. And such investment increases states' redistributive or coercive capacity, respectively. And because both public goods provision and repression require direct engagement with populations, um, this development of local capacity takes place, or uh, well, this development of state capacity takes place at the local level in political peripheries, and so I refer to it as local state capacity development. Um, and I'll use this simple two by two to explain the uh, causal pathways that I've just identified in a bit more detail, starting with the two uh, columns. So use this term societal pressure um, up on top to refer to political mobilization that provides society, civil society, with the capability to act on popular disaffection with government performance. And uh, to illustrate the effects of the societal pressure on elite behavior, I discuss two ideal types that occupy the extreme positions along this uh, continuum of society elite relations. And uh, they're represented here in the two uh, columns of the two by two. So some national political elites are insulated from societal pressure. For instance, if they preside over a consolidated authoritarian regime, such as the one in Uganda. And such elites have little reason to build redistributive capacity. Uh, you know, public service provision is costly, and even if it may limit popular disaffection, it is really unlikely to prevent political mobilization, which would be the, the goal. Um, so government resources are in these conditions better spent on preventing political mobilization in the first place, which can be done most effectively with the help of clientelistic networks that tie national political elites to political agents uh, operating uh, at the local level and potentially uh, capable of mobilizing social forces against the government. And as the huge literature on clientelism and neopatrimonialism shows, uh, distribution of goods, uh, private goods or client, uh, 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 clientelistic goods doesn't require capable state structures. <clears throat> And at the other end of the spectrum, um, other national political elites are highly vulnerable to societal pressure. This is true of democracies, such as Kenya, but also of weaker, less consolidated authoritarian regimes, such as the one in Ethiopia. And if society is capable of mobilizing to exert pressure on national political elites, um, then popular disaffection with government performance can pose a serious threat to uh, those elites' uh, political survival. And so it is in those elites' interests to respond to such threat by preventing or at least addressing popular disaffection through provision of, through provision of public goods and services to the people on whose approval they depend. Um, and in these, in, these, in these conditions, local redistributive capacity increases. So my discussion over the last few minutes has focused on national political elites, uh, but local political elites can also have varying levels of vulnerability to pressure from their local societies, um, although their ability to respond to this pressure is generally quite limited, unless they at the same time enjoy a high degree of autonomy from national elites, which is uh, another, uh, uh, which is a topic that I'll address briefly 
a little later in uh, the talk. Well, now let's turn our attention to the rows of the two by two. Um, and they represent, again, the extreme ends of the spectrum on which relations now between national and local elites are located. So local elites are useful to their national counterparts because they can serve as intermediaries when intermediaries when dealing with local populations, uh, which is especially important in the context of political peripheries uh, about which the national government may possess limited information. And as such, it is in central elites interest to co-opt local power brokers. But their ability to co-op local elites depends on the balance of power between the two elite categories. So co-optation is attractive to those local leaders if private or club goods that are offered to them by their national counterparts are more valuable than political power that is derived from mobilization of uh, their local people. Um, and so Given this, we can expect cooperation to be limited to relatively weak local elites who cannot effectively resist government coercion. Um, and this is what we see in Moroto in Uganda. And um, with a caveat that I'll explain later towards the end of the talk in Borena in Ethiopia. And um, government efforts to increase the uh, their capacity to govern political peripheries have very often relied on coercion because of the effectiveness of demonstrations of military coercive strength, at least in the absence of uh, political mobilization. And since um, local elite cooptation precludes such political mobilization, um, well, this leads to government use of coercion and investment in coercive state capacity. But in contrast, where local elites are relatively strong and capable of mobilizing their people to oppose government actions, those local leaders can resist co-optation, they can attain autonomy, and they can negotiate with and exert pressure on their national counterparts. Um, and especially where such local elites are themselves vulnerable to local society pressure, they have little to gain from the subjugation um, of their kin, and so they are likely to use uh, negotiations in which they engage to try to prevail upon their national counterparts to refrain from using coercion and instead provide public services. Um, and such an outcome reduces the incentive to invest in the buildup of the course and capacity um, and may lead to some additional investment in redistributive capacity. And this is what we see across the Kenyan section of the drylands, especially in Turkana and to a much, much more limited extent in Amudat in Uganda. <clears throat> the Dryland region um, is a suitable location to investigate local state capacity development and to test this theory um, for several reasons. So first, um, the establishment of new state structures in the previously long marginalized region only dates back to the start of this century. It has been very rapid, which helps to avoid the kind of entertainment problems inherent to slower processes of local state capacity development. Um, relatedly, um, it is possible here to collect information uh, about this process directly from members of the political elites and from affected populations. Um, and as we have already seen, multiple values of all the uh, variables of interest are present in the drylands. And finally, and very importantly, um, the characteristics of the dryland region allow me to control for the effects of other potential predictors of state capacity development. And specifically, I take advantage of the quasi-random colonial era allocation of sections of the drylands to Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda, and of the distribution of ethnic groups within the dryland region. Um, so over a century ago, several different ethnic groups were arbitrarily divided between the three countries, and then until the start of this century, basically left to their own devices. 
So we have the Adhikara people who live in all three countries, uh, in Nyangatom in Ethiopia in the north, in Turkana in Kenya to the south, and in Moroto in Nakapiripiri in Uganda to the west of Turkana. Then we have the Borana, um, and their territory is split between the uh, somewhat confusingly spelled Borana in Ethiopia in the north and Marsabit in Kenya in the south. And um, Amudat in Uganda and West Pokot to the east of Amudat in Kenya are both home to the Pokot ethnic uh, group. We also have maps later on in the slides to uh, try to minimize the confusion uh, that is bound to be caused by all of these unfamiliar names. Anyway, these conditions make it possible to hold local, political, socioeconomic characteristics constant and to conduct a border design natural experiment. So with this research design, well, it allows me to kind of manipulate the values of the two independent variables, which are the lead vulnerability to of pressure and the enter lead balance of power, um, and also the variance of the treatment that have been administered uh, in the seven quasi-experimental conditions that correspond to the seven areas um, of the three countries. Um, and the depend dependent variable here is uh, the type of state capacity. And um, data on state capacity development um, in the drylands that I report in this talk are uh, drawn from a uh, representative survey that I conducted in the region. It was, by the way, uh, the first uh, cross-border survey ever conducted in, uh, in the drylands. Um, and a quick note here on the measures of state capacity that um, I've developed for uh, this project. Um, so the most commonly used proxy for state capacity, which is taxation, is it really suitable for measuring coercive and redistributive state capacity. Um, so instead to uh, operationalize um, the two types of state capacity, I develop well, several different measures uh, uh, of state capacity that focus on local populations access to the state. And for the purposes of this talk, um, I'll focus on the uh, presence of the military as a proxy for the strength of the coercive apparatus and on access to government constructed roads, which is indicative of redistributive capacity. Uh, but I can also show you data collected using other measures during the Q&A if anyone is interested. Um, and to explain the development of different types of state capacity in different areas of the drylands, um, also conducted archival and media research, and most importantly, uh, interviews. So I was able to interview for the project some of the most important national and local political leaders involved in building those new state structures uh, in the, in the drylands, from uh, national government ministers, to MPs, to senior local government officials, to the uh, customary leaders of the local ethnic groups. Um, and I collected all these data uh, in 65 research sites in the seven areas of the drylands, um, as well as in the capital cities of Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda uh, over the course of some 12 months in uh, 2016 and 2018. Now let's talk about the uh, results of the study, um, starting with cross-country variation in redistributive um, state capacity uh, development. Um, so the plot on this slide shows the proportion of survey respondents reporting distance to means of transport, which is made possible by government uh, construction of roads, um, first at the start of the 21st century and then 15 years after uh, the process, well, 15 years into the process of building new state uh, state apparatuses. And these are some simple descriptive statistics, but I think they do a pretty good job of conveying both the scale of this redistributive capacity development and the differences 
between the three country sections of the drylands. And what we see here is substantial increase in the proportion of respondents having access to means of transport in Kenya, and especially in Ethiopia, but not in Uganda. And why is that? Well, the Ethiopian and Kenyan political elites are both highly vulnerable to societal pressure. Um, so in Kenya, um, buildup of both domestic political mobilization and also international pressure um, led to the country's gradual democratization, which began in the early 1990s. And several decades later, the Kenyan political elite is now kept in check by regular free and fair, fair elections and uh, well-organized civil society. Um, in Ethiopia, um, as the newly now just begun, um, as of, as of two weeks ago, civil war shows, um, the country's authoritarian regime, which now operates under the umbrella of the Prosperity Party, what has never successfully consolidated power over the increasingly disaffected population, and despite the regime's brutality, um, it has faced regular protests and opposition from very well organized political adversaries, uh, culminating in the just begun civil war. Um, and the Ethiopian and Kenyan elites have responded to all this societal pressure and disaffection with expansion of public service provision and corresponding investment in the redistributive capacity of the two states. But in Uganda, um, President Yoweri Museveni has been in power since 1986, so twice as long as you know many of our students have been alive. Uh, he presides over this really consolidated national resistance movement or NRM regime, um, which has faced few substantial threats to its survival for decades now. Um, and the tendrils of Museveni's extensive patronage network kind of penetrate Ugandan society with most local notables and power brokers beholden to the president. Um, and the Ugandan state's redistributive capacity has in the meantime remained far weaker with many public services, uh, if they're available at all, provided by non-state organizations rather than the state. <clears throat> and um, on this slide, the plot shows the change in the distance to military posts, uh, also reported by survey respondents. And what is most striking here, as you can see on the right, is this massive expansion in the military presence in the Ugandan section of the drylands. And as you can see, no comparable um, growth in coercive capacity has taken place in the other two countries. Um, although, and I'll return to that a little later, uh, my other research suggests that the survey data understate the coercive capacity of the Ethiopian state in the drylands for reasons I'll return to uh, towards the end of the of the talk. But um, in Uganda, um, um, so President Museveni's very frequent use of force against multiple regime opponents, uh, mostly recently illustrated. Uh, earlier today or last, last night with the arrest of the currently most prominent opposition leader, um, Bobby Wine, well, this frequent use of force um, has made it necessary to construct a well-functioning coercive apparatus, and which was, among other things, deployed to bring Karamoja, which is that Ugandan section of the drylands, um, under government control in the mid 2000s, so halfway through the through last decade. And this deployment uh, continues to this day, 15 years later, because the regime considers Karamoja and its people to be uh, volatile and potentially threatening. Um, and this, is, this deployment has been supported by most Karamojan local leaders um, who have been fully co-opted uh, into Museveni's patronage network. Um, and in Ethiopia too, um, Despite the regime's vulnerability to side of pressure, um, the regime has not refrained from repression, which has been widespread across the country, um, including in the Ethiopian drylands after the government began to expand its power there in the, uh, in the, in the 2000s. Um, 
and after some early setbacks, uh, use of repression in the Ethiopian drylands has also been facilitated by the co-opted uh, local leaders. Um, but Kenya's story is very different. Um, so Kenya's long democratization process culminated in 2010 with uh, the National Political League's decision to adopt a new constitution that transferred much of the power in the country, or well, power resources in the country, uh, to new county governments that were established throughout, Ken throughout Kenya, including in the country's uh, northern dryland periphery. Uh, and these county governments are run by local leaders. Uh, and those county government leaders are largely autonomous from the national government. And so the Kenyan section of the drylands has seen no coercion, even as at the same time, as the previous slide showed, the provision of public services by the redistrib redistrib redistributive bodies of the county governments has greatly expanded and it accounts for um, all the, that redistributive capacity development in Kenya. Uh, so all that redistributive capacity government has taken capacity capacity development has taken place at the county level, at the local government level, rather than uh, in terms of provision of uh, public goods by uh, the national government. Um, and the pictures here um, show Kenya's then president, Mwai Kibaki, celebrating the adoption of the constitution in 2010, and Uganda's president, Museveni, uh, inspecting troops in Karamoja. All right, so now let's talk about subnational variation. And subnational variation is in absolute terms more limited than cross-country differences, but I think it's at least as illuminating. Um, and one of the benefits of this research design that I have here is that it allows comparison of both members of the same ethnic groups divided by national borders and also of different areas of the same countries. And to make things easier uh, for everyone, I'll go over the results country by country, by country uh, but I'll be happy to show within ethnic group, very, uh, group comparisons uh, in the Q&A as well, if anyone wants to see them. <coughs> Um, I'll start with Uganda, where you know, the weak leaders of the um, Karamojong Atakar ethnic group in districts such as Moroto um, have been fully co-opted into President Museveni's patronage network with predictable consequences. And uh, one of them, a former MP, uh, told me, just look at those leaders that are NRM. If you want to survive, you sing that song, you uh, drum that drum. Uh, you know, they have to do that for survival. Um, in contrast, um, among the Pokot, uh, which is another, the other ethnic group that lives to the south, uh, the Pokot's strong internal organization uh, in Amudat, which is the Ugandan section of Pokot territory, uh, uh, well, that strong organization of the Pokot elite, as well as their vulnerability internally uh, to pressure from co-ethnics, have strongly strengthened their negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis the uh, national government. Uh, as one of the most prominent and most powerful Ugandan Pokot leaders told me, uh, that leader basically warned President Museveni that he would mobilize his co-ethnics against the regime. Uh, and so the president agreed. And uh, such negotiations have limited the presence of the Ugandan army uh, in Amudat and led to some public service provision uh, in Amudat, which is more so than in the Atakar territory in Moroto to the, to the north. Um, in Kenya, so natural variation is quite limited, um, although the uh, Turkana governor, uh, his name is Joshua Nanok. He has proved more successful at both distancing himself from uh, national elites' interference and also at building a pretty high quality redistributive apparatus uh, 
of the county government uh, than his uh, counterparts, other governors elsewhere in northern Kenya, including in West Pokot here for comparison um, on the slide. And when speaking of this Turkana governor, Nanok, um, um, a Turkana member of parliament told me that the, there is nothing the national government can do in the county without the governor. And the governor, Nanok, he's used his autonomy from national government to try to meet the needs and demands of his Atakar ethnics to whom is vulnerable. And in the process, he built from scratch, uh, essentially a county government redistributive apparatus that is widely regarded as one of the best in Kenya. And finally, uh, we have Ethiopia. Um, so I previously mentioned the uh, setbacks that the Ethiopian government encountered when it tried to co-opt the local elite in the Ethiopian section of the drylands. Uh, so uh, what happened is that the local Burana leaders in Burana, well, they basically just misjudged their position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the re regime, and they chose to oppose the government uh, when it started expanding its power in the area. And most of those local Burana leaders were consequently killed by the Ethiopian army or exiled, and they were replaced by uh, Burana, handpicked and fully co-opted by the Ethiopian government. Uh, so this example showed the Burana that opposition to the regime was futile and very dangerous, uh, so much so that the regime didn't even need to invest in the development of a locally based uh, course of apparatus, uh, even if the uh, threat of deployment of troops elsewhere in Uganda is always present. Um, but at the same time, this regime created Burana local elite has tried to encourage the regime to prioritize public service provision uh, in Burana in order to counter this uh, local elite's lack of legitimacy uh, and local support among their co-ethnics. Um, and in neighboring Nyangatom to, uh, to, to the west, uh, um, well, expansion of public service provision there has been definitely much more limited than in Burana, um, even if you can't quite see that in the plot here because of issues with uh, data. Uh, uh, and this is because the Nyangatom Adhikar leaders accepted regime domination uh, without any problems, just in exchange for private and club goods to those local leaders. All right. So these findings, uh, well, they offer broad support for uh, the, the argument that I outlined earlier. Um, we see that in the drylands, expansion of local redistributive state capacity and expansion of public goods provision um, can be attributed to uh, elite vulnerability to societal pressure. And at the same time, co-optation of local elites uh, predicts government use of repression and growth of the coercive state capacity. Um, and the variation in the values of all those different variables of interest here uh, provides a lot of opportunity to falsify my claims. Um, but with the exception of Borena, throughout the dry land region, all the different configurations of these values uh, kind of follow, remain constant with my, uh, with my argument. All right, so um, why does it all matter? Well, so I would say that the main contribution of this research is that I disaggregate state capacity into its constituent components. And I show that states seeking to increase their governing, governing capacity at the uh, local level, prioritize investment in different kinds of state capacity and also explain uh, why they do so. And I also draw attention to the often neglected role of local political elites in state building processes. Um, and I contribute to this uh, rapidly growing literature on the unevenness um, in states' territorial reach uh, by showing that uh, state capacity varies not only by its level, but also kind or type. And uh, I also provide contemporary empirical evidence of local state capacity uh, construction, um, which complements the mostly historical data that have been collected by other scholars. And um, 
Finally, uh, in order to provide all this evidence, I developed some new empirical measures of state capacity um, that go beyond uh, the literature's standard focus on taxation um, that can also be applied in other contexts. All right, so um, thank you so much for uh, listening to, uh, uh, to me. Um, it's been a pleasure to share some of my research with you and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you think about it and any suggestions for uh, refinement uh, as well as to answering any questions that you might have for me. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for the for the talk. Um, now we have a, a little bit more than, uh, well, about 30 minutes uh, that we can dedicate to some questions. So if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and just unmute and ask, or if you, you're more comfortable um, putting your question in the chat, that's fine too. Uh, so the floor is open. Uh, any questions or comments? So I have a, a several kind of questions and comments, if you don't mind. Um, I'm hiding in the other room, so that's why I've had a change of background. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, super interesting, and 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 I, I like um, I like what you've done. I like the natural experiment. I like uh, yeah, this is great. This is a great um, project. Um, just a couple. Uh, this is kind of a random smattering of of questions and comments, but um, so I just wonder. Like first, like on a theoretical level, if there's a difference between the existence of capacity and the use of capacity, so like the actual deployment of capacity, because it seems like we, we, you know, in some ways are measuring. So in some in some cases, we measure the existence, right, of state capacity, and in other times, we measure kind of the potential, or kind of maybe the potential, and then kind of the use. I'm just wondering if there's actually a theoretical difference between that. Um, and then I'm curious about your measures. So um, I'm curious why you measure the distance to roads and military posts through a survey. Um, this seems, yeah, on the one hand, this is, yeah, this is totally not, well, I mean, regardless of how you measure it, it is a novel measure. And so that's, you know, that's great. Um, but I'm curious why, you know, why, why measure this through a survey? And actually, are people's assessments or people's estimates of this accurate? Do they have a kind of, do they have a good sense of the units of measurement that you're using? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you gave them something appropriate, obviously, um, that and understandable to, to choose from. Um, but I'm wondering if you have kind of corroborating data and if there's alternative ways of measuring. So like this could be kind of local units um, from, you know, there's probably government data, right, on, um, you know, distance to roads and uh, distance to military posts, I would assume. And I, actually, that's another measure of state capacity, right? If governments actually have that data uh, or if they don't. Um, but I also wonder if, if in your survey, um, you cover more direct measures of legitimacy, right? Because the redistributive state capacity has implications for legitimacy. And so I'm wondering if you triangulate, you know, sort of your legitimacy outcomes um, with, or, you know, your kind of proxy for legitimacy gaining, um, you know, attributes of the state um, with measures of like public trust or accountability or something like that. Um, and then two just really quick comments. I think that when you say local, you mean ethnic local, right? And I think that's pretty clear, but I, it just occurred to me that maybe sometimes local doesn't always communicate the ethnic dynamic of the, the, lo the local leaders. And then one final question is, um, I, you know, one thing that I really like about this is that it doesn't really, it really takes the focus off regime type as an explanation for um, variations in, in what we see. At the same time, I mean, everybody always wants to know, right, if there's a linkage between co especially coercive state capacity and um, authoritarianism. And so I'm wondering if there is a, a part that you kind of that you discuss the implications of um, of your findings for regime type as well. So please don't feel like feel like you have to address all of those questions. But I, you know, those are the those are the things that came up to me. And if they're useful to you in any way, then then I, I hope they are.
No, no, wonderful, challenging questions. Thank you, Karis. Uh, Brian, how should we do it? Should I respond and or should we collect a round of questions? No, I think I think respond uh, as as we go along. So mm -hmm. go ahead. Um, okay, so uh, let me start with uh, the questions that are probably easier to answer, whether my answers are satisfactory or not. That's a that, that, that's a different issue. Measures of legitimacy. Um, so I didn't try to measure legitimacy directly. I have some questions, not even in the survey. So within the survey was embedded a survey experiment and some of the survey experiment questions get at preferences concerning different types of authority. And I guess those can be interpreted as measuring legitimacy, but it probably better measures for slightly different uh, slightly different things. So in this project, at least when I started it, I wasn't really interested in legitimacy per se, but you're right, because legitimacy is so important. It, you know, with benefit of hindsight, which is 2020, uh, uh, it would have been useful to include some questions concerning legitimacy more directly uh, as well. Um, the local and ethnic leaders issue, uh, Yes, so I'm like, we're talking about a place where uh, the uh, salience of ethnicity, political salience of ethnicity is very prominent. So any leader, local, national, or any kind of leader, uh, political, religious, uh, municipal, civic, whatnot, will be associated with uh, an ethnic identity and will make claims uh, followers support based on their uh, belonging to some ethnic uh, ethnic community. Question about regime. So this is something that I address indirectly here and perhaps I should make it a bit more explicit, but what I try to do is, I think exactly what you, uh, you are getting at, is that I try to, so I'm not really satisfied with saying, well, it's a regime, I want to understand what it is about regimes that explains this variation, this investment in different kinds of state of state capacity, which is why the two independent variables that I have, they can be in a way seen as a ways of also disaggregating regime type as much as as a state capacity, because what I suggest, what I think at this stage in the project is that what it is about the state, including the political regime, uh, that is uh, most important is not really, you know, how leaders are selected or the, and those other key characteristics of regime type, but uh, these two things. So broader relationship with the population and how vulnerable to the uh, to pressure from the population the elite is, whether it is democratic or authoritarian, as well as relations between local and national political leaders. Again, irrespective of whether the overall political regime is uh, democratic or authoritarian or whether we have some pockets of authoritarianism at the local level, which uh, also happens uh, even in otherwise democratic countries uh, and uh, so on. Uh, the question about the existence versus use or deployment of state capacity. Well, that's a much more difficult, much more challenging question. And I'm not sure I know the answer. And I think it is very important that we as scholars of state capacity think about it. So my kind of like knee jerk immediate reaction is that when the state has the capacity to do so, it does so. Um, so perhaps there isn't that much of a distinction here. And when the, sta when the state has overall relatively high levels of state capacity, but is not in a position to use that state capacity, for example, in a politically peripheral area, what it takes is not simply deploying that capacity, but actually constructing state capacity at the local level. But that's kind of like what I'm thinking right now, thinking on my feet. Uh, but this is a great question and something for me to uh, 
think about uh, in, more, in more detail, definitely. So this is actually really, really useful. Um, and finally, the, uh, the question about measuring all this uh, through a survey. And so here, this is, you know, this is a strong limitation of this project. Ideally, we should not ask, you know, random people uh, what they think about, you know, objectively existing things such as, you know, distance from different uh, from, from different locations. Um, the problem is that here we're talking about governments that have greatly expanded their local capacity to govern, but their absolute level of state capacity is still really low. So government data on all these things do not exist. And collecting all that data on my own would not have been feasible given the resource constraints. And since I was doing a survey anyway, asking people about a whole bunch of other uh, other things, I included those questions uh, uh, as well. Uh, and so this is a limitation for, of this project for the reasons that you already mentioned, but also um, and another thing that uh, that I'm guilty of is that I asked people about not only what is the situation on the ground at the time of collecting data, but also 15 years before and relying on people's recall. And perhaps especially uh, when we ask uh, people with very low, very limited formal education, uh, that is very far from ideal. So yes, uh, there's definitely some some strong limitations to what I to the data that I have here. No, thanks. I appreciate all of that. And I just want to say, I, it doesn't, I don't think it has to be a limitation. I think you could probably spin it as a strength, right? Like as some sort of perception of state capacity, right? And make a make try to make a link to legitimacy, right? Like here, in, like if you can show that there's increases increased perceptions of state capacity, this is like. It's also a kind of, um, especially if it's, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not exactly sure how that would work out, but I'm sure you can spin it as a strength. I'm sure you can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's a no, great project. I, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Th thank you for your questions and uh, comments, Karis. I have a question. Hello, everybody. Hello, Alain. Um, yeah, my question is about the, the so, so, so societal, societal, how do you pronounce that? Pressure, societal? I pronounce it societal. Societal, yes, uh, pressure. Um, because when I first saw this um, in, the, in your presentation, I was, what came to my mind was uh, people's resistance, yeah, to state authority, like in the sense of Scott, like for instance, right? Mm -hmm. um, people don't want to be governed by the state. They don't want, they don't want to recognize. I mean, it, it touches a bit on the issue of, Legitimacy that Chris talked about, um, but um, but what you mean by if I understood correctly, what you mean by this is more uh, resistance from the elites. Am I correct? So this is so this is the focus. So in this um, in this specific theme of the project, I am looking uh, specifically on what elites do, and you know. Uh, yeah, how, how, how local elites respond to the encroachment by national elites and national government on their uh, mm -hmm. autonomy and what national elites do to co-opt uh, local elites and so on. And of course, a whole huge dimension of all this that I do not, did not address in this talk uh, is the regular people's take uh, on all of this, which is why I was because I was interested in that in this was one of the reasons why I conducted uh, a survey and actually so this is it doesn't like directly pertain to what I was talking about today but one of the most remarkable I thought findings from the survey was a very strong support by regular people for inclusion in the state. So we're talking about areas that had never ever been effectively administered by any state. Local ethnic groups had never created states of their own. They always relied on alternative uh, modes of governance. Uh, and then the colonial state and for the first several decades, post-colonial states never made any efforts to 
effectively incorporate those populations uh, and govern them mm -hmm. until just the last two decades. And what I find is very strong support for that incorporation into, into, into the state because uh, people want access to public goods and services that the states that, that, that the state offers. So this finding is very much in opposition, in contrast to what Scott would suggest, that even if historically, you know, uh, people, people's obsomia, in his example, wanted to evade the state because they didn't want their resources, their wealth extracted by the state in exchange for nothing, now people see the benefits of incorporation of into the state because the nature of the state has realistically changed. And although state can be oppressive and brutal, and the Ugandan and Ethiopian states in these in this case certainly are, those states can also provide uh, healthcare and education and access to trade opportunities and so on. And you know, uh, modern innovations such as electricity and clean water, and people do want access to those. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, thanks. I was just wondering if you <clears throat> were accounting for, yeah, local people's uh, views on the state and if they, yeah, you answered the question, but. I have a follow-up based on what uh, Helene was saying. Hello, Helene, by the way. <laughs> um, so, uh, Am I correct in, in, uh, in thinking that uh, um, Ethiopia and Kenya are both, they have some version of federalism, uh, some kind of ethnic federalism. Uh, that's the way that those break down. So I'm wondering, could some of these um, uh, features that you're pointing to be a kind of a dynamic of federalism versus the uh, authoritarian? Because I, I believe that federalism didn't work in Uganda, right? Or, or it kind of collapsed. Um, I don't. My history here is not quite right. But so, how, how does how would this map over the um, the dynamic that you're talking about? Yeah, I'm like Uganda had this quasi federal system way back when, shortly after independence. But since then, it has been a uh, centralized state, and you know has become increasingly centralized, despite some uh, official decentralization efforts that have been primarily intended to build the, uh, well, to co-op local leaders into the, uh, the president's, uh, in President Museveni's uh, patronage network. And there's some great literature on that, on the, on, the, on the topic. I don't really have much new to add to that because all that has been said. Um, so Kenya is a federal state. It is not officially one, because according to the constitution, it's a unitary state, but uh, in practice it is. And the federal units, which are known uh, as counties, do have a lot of power. And so this is significant. But technically, and, and this is not a, an ethnic federal system in Kenya. Uh, Ethiopia has an ethnic federal system officially, and officially uh, the federal units are even stronger and more auto autonomous uh, than those in Kenya and are given the right to secede and, uh, and, and all of that. But in practice, with the exception of Tigray, which is in the north, so like the opposite end of the country from uh, what uh, I'm looking at, looking at here, the regional states, they're known as Kilil, uh, they've never really had any real power. So what I would say here is that what matters is not the formal structure of the state, but who has power uh, when it comes to this balance of power between national and local elites. And in Kenya, the local elites do have a lot of power. In Ethiopia, they do not, again, with the exception of the Tigrayan elite, which is the reason why there is now a civil war going on in, uh, in northern Ethiopia as of the last few weeks. So I just have like uh, two or three questions, like in general, kind of. So I'm not an expert in Africa for sure. So, uh, so I was just kind of wondering about kind of conceptualization of your independent variable in general. 
that the first uh, you talked about kind of you know the national local relationship in the context of like local autonomy or the opposite you know cooperation but i was wondering how how this conceptualization is like different from like Say the ability of local elite to pull uh, like pork from from the national state in the like kind of clientelistic context. So I was, you know, I was wondering Sorry, like again, the, how the line is quite bad, and uh, I think I could understand most of what you said. But can you repeat what you said in the last in a thirty seconds or so? I'm sorry. Um, so so I was wondering that the uh, so how it's different from like a clientelistic power, like power of the local elite to just pull up pork for their region and the you know, local autonomy uh, kind of concept is how, how, how it's kind of different or maybe the same according to you is, is it's kind of one I was wondering that the, and the other thing is that the, so you talk about kind of vulnerability, the another independent variable that the vulnerability to the societal pressure, but uh, so here, you know, it kind of makes sense, but I was wondering about what are the kind of sources of the societal pressure comes from? Uh, and then also, like I was wondering, kind of endogeneity between two uh, independent variables. But at least in the Ugandan case, it seems like you explain a way that that two elements are interrelated, you know, according to my hearing uh, of the presentation. I'm not sure that's what you intended. So, uh, so that's so maybe like I'm concerned uh, maybe the most about kind of the indigeneity between two independent variable if these two things like local autonomy and societal pressure is like endogenous to each other then kind of you know your theory seems to assume that the, these are these two are independently assigned so I was wondering how uh, on that dimension and uh, and the last uh, Kind of separate kind of question is is that the kind of what are the alternative explanation in general uh, uh, to your explanation? So like I I kind of I buy your uh, you know general explanation of the event, but I didn't really know what are the possible alternatives to your explanation in terms of both the viability of your uh, thesis and how, how your kind of study is rejecting such alternative explanation is, is kind of uh, one thing I, that's just not clear to me uh, through uh, your presentation. And in the last, last very little comment, uh, and you talk about the natural experiment, but I, I think the natural experiment part is about the national borders, right? So I thought like natural experiment is not Natural experiment design is not there in terms of the sub national differences. So I just wanted to make sure that for that point that the, you know when you're explaining sub national variations that that's more probably that these borders or that like these variations could be endogenous uh, compared to this kind of clear uh, exogenous border you set between the countries. Uh, it's kind of the scattered comment that uh, the, the the presentation is really interesting and. Uh, yeah, like I, I'm actually really interested in like studying the public opinion in Africa sometime in the future. So thank you for oh. very detailed, like deep insights. Great, thank you, Genta, and fantastic questions. Uh, on the last point, you're absolutely right. So natural experiment here in, involves this uh, quasi-random assignment of territories across natural borders. And at the subnational level, the assignment is not quasi random. It reflects largely uh, the <laughs> historical livelihood practices of local ethnic groups. And so uh, uh, environmental conditions and things like that. So you're right, there's no, no natural experiment at the, uh, uh, at the, at the subnational level. Uh, so yeah, I include subnational variation here because I think it is substantively really, really interesting. Uh, but you know, in terms of the research design that I that I outlined, yeah, it's kind of um, kind of a little uh, a little iffy. Uh, your first question was so your line was the worst when you were asking the first question. So as I understood, you were asking about the conceptual difference between pork and clientelism. Is that what the question was? 
I, I, my question is more about like, you know, the parking, you know, the, I feel like the intuitive explanation why you are getting more public goods provision is that the local elites are powerful enough to pull a pork from the national budget, maybe. That's, that's why I was kind of intuitively thinking about. And I don't know how it's interrelated with their concept of local autonomy and cooperation, uh, because it's possible that the local elites can you know, pull a pork, but still cop with the national. You know, so you know, being independent from the uh, national level uh, authority is, I thought, like it's a bit different from from the ability to pull a pork from like the budget. So I was wondering, like, to clarify on these distinctions here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm like, so here I just follow the guidance of the massive literature on clientelism and neo-patrimonialism in Africa, which suggests that there is not mm -hmm. and should not really be any uh, relationship between provision, the provision of public goods uh, and private goods to clients. Um, and uh, that has to do in part with the uh, development of African states that has just simply how it has happened but also there is a very good political economy reason for that in that you know in the United States for example or in places like this that where, where you think about pork it is easy for for example local elite to skim of the top. You know, there's public goods going in, massive amounts, millions and billions of dollars, and, you know, uh, elites can get rich of, you know, skimming of the, of the top. Uh, the absolute size of budgets in Africa is too small for that, for that to be possible. So the question becomes, essentially, and today is becoming a bit less so, but historically it was definitely true. The question was, do you provide private goods to your clients or do you try to invest in provision of public goods to everyone? And historically, African governments, uh, going back to early post-colonial times, uh, all, almost exclusively prioritized uh, private, good, good, private goods provision to uh, or a club of goods provision to uh, to clients. Um, your next question was um, so you had a question about the two independent variables, right? There was also another question. Can you remind me what that was? I should have written that down. Yeah, just uh, just that I was wondering: is there any like indigeneity between your two independent variables? Uh, that's mm -hmm. kind of my question. And for for the fourth thing, that that was uh, really interesting. Um, just so comment that the so like if the private you know distribution of private goods is the default for the African in African context, does it mean that the uh, the, the the districts you are having the low like you know how the cooperation co is happening? Does it mean that there are low, like more private goods than public goods in that district? And then in the public good provision district, is that does that mean that you know you, you have less? Oh uh, yeah. So the mm -hmm. yeah. So the idea here would be that you know if governments make this trade-off between private and public goods provision, is that when they co-opt local elites, then they provide them with public goods at the expense of not providing public goods, or uh, conversely, if they if the government provides public goods, well, then leaves less money available for. Uh, uh, for private goods. Uh, but your question about indigeneity and the two independent variables is excellent. And I don't really, I don't know what the answer to this question is, and which is why it's such a great question that I'll need to think deeply about. Because, so, when I think about it, I see them as two distinct issues. But then I suppose you're right when, you know, to at least suspect that there may be some connection because uh, when, uh, when, uh, well, yeah, because when, um, 
local leaders are relatively autonomous from the national government. They are in a position to build, uh, to politically mobilize their supporters, their, their local people, and that enhances the level of uh, uh, pressure that society exerts on the government. So in this sense, you are absolutely right. And this might be a really serious concern, whether it is in kind of like in practice, I'll need to uh, think about it. But yes, this is a, a really, really great question. Yeah, I have a, <clears throat> a few questions. Uh, following up on this, I think so the balance of power variable, it comes from the IR literature. Uh, so there are two states, each of them are, have uh, weaknesses and strength. So technically it's vulnerability. We could probably, you could rephrase it as vulnerability of national elites versus local elites. Mm -hmm. And then your first independent variable would be vulnerability of elites to social pressure. And here you would need to be very careful with what uh, what is uh, on both sides of the um, of these vulnerabilities, because you you may have um, you may have uh, the same vulnerability, but then different outcomes. And I think I think it will be more elegant to have vulnerability in both uh, uh, in both uh, variables. Uh, rather than balance of power, I think this idea of vulnerability is easier because this, I mean, it shows the mutual dependence. Uh, but in IR, balance of power means that you don't need, these two states don't have, don't necessarily have to be mutually dependent. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great suggestion about, you know, how to label uh, those, uh, uh, the, the, those variables. Yeah, that's uh, that's very useful. Thank you, Alexei. And uh, another thing is that, um, so we have two outcomes now, uh, coercion or um, provision of public goods. But there is also the third, you know, the third uh, outcome may be the collusion. And I think Gento mentioned about the milking. Uh, I mean, both local elites and national elites can plunder uh, the state budget or straight state coffers or state tre treasure, whatever, natural riches. And so there is a collusion, collusion and uh, it leads to the lack of public goods. In other words, it's kind of a, a race to the bottom and exploitation and then hoping that the wor world community will somehow save uh, and, and uh, come to help. So I think, I mean, there is so. There, there is some research about this. There are three, basically. So there is a cooptation, the repression, and this collusion where there is a... Um, so anyway, that's in other words, lack of... Uh, and then more specifically, maybe in, your other, in, 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 the, in the other parts of your big project is about the... So Uganda, um, I mean, Uganda, let's say, it was very hawkish towards it neighboring country. And it, was, it was what, sorry? It was hawkish. In other words, Mussolini uh -huh. threatened to, you know, to attack or whatever. Uh, he, you know, he wants to be, be a big man among in the neighborhood. And mm -hmm. So maybe that explains, I mean, it may explain why Uganda has more military bases in neighbor, in the border regions, in the border province. And one last thing is about um, uh, so for the army to you know to put lots of military bases, you need to have good roads for the you know to improve the supply and all the communication and so forth. And so when you measure the uh, public good provision by the access to road, you know that the access to road may actually be improving the repression capacity. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to think, I mean, this is a very good finding, very, uh, it's a good indicator, but when Keres was talking about the use of capacity, maybe you could, maybe you have it in your data already in your text about this, you know, use uh, of roads for military purposes. And then the paradox may be why, why you have bases 
military bases, but then not not many roads that, or maybe roads only go to bases, not where people uh, live in Thailand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm like, uh, you're absolutely right on that, on that last point. And so thankfully I have other measures that show similar patterns, which suggests to me that my overall interpretation is correct. But you're also right because where we see the highest concentration of military bases in the Ugandan section of the drylands, we actually also see road construction. So there is one major road that has been built uh, in the Ugandan section of the dryland, uh, and it has been uh, and it has been uh, built for two reasons. The first one is to provide access to military military, military barracks. And the other one is to provide access, uh, facilitate exploitation of uh, natural resources, which reminds me that I never um, answered Gento's question about alternative uh, uh, alternative explanations. Uh, you had a point about uh, Museveni's posturing and like his, you know, hawkish attitude uh, towards neighbors. Well, that attitude has been limited to weaker neighbors. So Museveni has been very happy to play strongman uh, in relations with uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and with South Sudan, and to some extent with Rwanda, but not with Kenya and not with uh, Ethiopia. And there is no real threat to territorial integrity uh, because of the strong post-colonial consensus in Africa about the unviolability of uh, colonial era borders. So uh, that doesn't really explain the uh, expansion in the number of troops, especially that it is really limited to the Ugandan territory, because if this were an international competition situation, then you would expect to see uh, the other governments responding to that military buildup and uh, deploying their own troops. And that's never happened. And that's because in Uganda, as you know, in many other African countries and other countries, the military serves even more to control uh, and suppress the population as it does to uh, protect uh, uh, the external interests of the um, of the of the of the state. Uh, and this brings me to the alternative explanation. So the question of Gantuzari that I never. Um, that, that I never um, that, that I never answered. Um, so I already uh, answered um, Ellen's question, or was it no Karis's question about regime type? You'd think that the level of state capacity might be an alternative explanation for what we see, but the state capacity of all three countries is very very similar. So it cannot really account for this very substantial cross national variation that we see. Uh, you think that level of economic development could explain the variation, and there is substantial variation across these countries in uh, the level of economic development as proxied by uh, GDP per capita. Uh, but what we see, so like, you know, in the, my findings earlier, we see a lot of variation between Ethiopia and Uganda, which not only have very similar levels, uh, very similar or well, relatively similar regime types, but also very similar similar levels of economic development. Uh, uh, so that doesn't really uh, explain what we see. Um, another potential alternative explanation could be uh, natural resources, and there is a lot of natural resources in some areas of the dryland region. But the thing is, in Uganda you have gold and marble and lots of other minerals in Morocco, but not in Amudat, but you see expansion of state presence and buildup of state capacity in both areas. In Ethiopia, you have sugar plantations that have been developed in Yangatom, um, but Borena to the east hasn't seen, uh, well, doesn't have any natural resources and it has seen even more buildup of state capacity. In Kenya, Turkana has fairly substantial uh, amounts of oil, but other areas of northern Kenya do not and do not have any comparable natural resources, and they also have seen similar uh, similar uh, increases in state presence and local state uh, state capacity. 
Um, Alexei, did I miss any of your questions? I, I hope I didn't. No, this uh, outcome about the, the third outcome, the collusion in which both national and local leads uh, cooperate and they are not, you know, they are doing something else, not public good and not, not repressing. Yeah, that, that, that's right. I'm like, so my response to that, and again, it's something that I'll, I'll need to think carefully about, is that if you have a situation in which uh, you have national local elites allied, so you let's use the term co-option as I use, use for now, well, they help themselves to public resources and, you know, reallocate them for uh, private uses. Uh, what is the local population's response? Well, or like, what is regular people's response? Well, they're not happy. And without elites, they might lack the ability to mobilize, uh, but they're still unhappy. And so, you know, at the very least, there will be sponta spontaneous outbreaks of that disaffection. And what that would uh, require in turn is coercion on the part of the state to, to contain them. So that's my like quick thinking on the topic, but there's definitely more to that that I haven't, that I haven't thought about while thinking uh, on my feet here. So uh, thank you for that. And we have a link. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Carol, you can read the chat. Yeah, it's just yeah. that I'm, I wasn't sure um, uh, if um, we would have time because it's almost nine. So I thought I would formulate it in a written form. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, international aid commercial partnerships as an alternative explanation, and especially in relation to China. Um, well, so I'm like, you know, the presence of China is substantial, uh, as is that of other commercial partners, and, you know, there is quite a lot of aid. Uh, so the question is kind of like distribution of aid. Uh, can it explain the variation that we see? And I don't quite, I, I don't quite, quite see that. There is no evidence to suggest that. Um, quite on the contrary, in the sense, and like this doesn't really relate to China as such, but more traditional aid donors historically have often channeled aid through the UN and non-governmental organizations, and that for the longest time served as a reason for governments not to invest in their own presence and capacity in the region because humanita humanitarian aid in response to droughts and epidemics uh, and so on could be provided by other organizations. Uh, and the levels of aid have, of course, fluctuated, but they haven't been changing all that much. And I don't see anything in how that aid is distributed across countries and across different subnational areas that would suggest that it might have had any effect at all on anything that we see. Uh, the role of China Again, that's so the presence of China is new, as is this investment of state capacity. So that would be, uh, you know, something that was, you know, more immediately potentially a cause. Uh, and there is some presence of Chinese companies in the in the in the region. Uh, so in Ethiopia, uh, uh, the Chinese corporation has been building uh, uh, has been building roads in Kenya outside of the dryland region, but elsewhere in Kenya, uh, uh, Ch a Chinese company with a huge loan by the, Ch Chinese, by the Chinese government or by, by Chinese government has built a new, uh, a new railway. There is some more limited presence of Chinese companies in Uganda as well. But I just don't, there is nothing that about Chinese presence that would explain the patterns of state capacity development that we see. Because one can imagine a hypothetical scenario in which there are 
resources or something else that China or Ch Chinese companies are interested in, and that, that may prompt the government to invest in more state capacity. Sure, but that would mean that that investment in state capacity would be restricted to those areas with resources that are attractive to Chinese uh, Chinese companies, and we don't really see that as I as I explained when I was talking about uh, extractive potential. So I don't think so. So, all right, I think, well, unless there's a very short Can comment. Uh, comment please? <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Um, yeah, but just um, in my class, like um, I always show in uh, my class, uh, when we talk about uh, the intro to comparative politics, we always talk about state capacity and I always show the fragile state index. And I was very surprised to see Kenya there um, uh, up until 2012 in the top 10 of the most fragile states, Uganda uh, and Ethiopia were there too. Um, so the thing is, you mentioned it already. So these are states that really have low capacity. So my question is, aren't, is it normal to see some development? It's just they're starting from so low, they can only grow, right? Um, or, um, I mean, or I mean, I guess you could stagnate forever, um, but it's just that it's already their state capacities can only build up um, because it's so limited. Um, I'm like, you know, Kenya's inclusion uh, or like uh, position on the fragile state index tells you more about the quality of the fragile state index than it does about the quality of the Kenyan state or really any any other state. So like, you know, to an extent you're right, uh, overall levels of state capacity are really low. Um, so there is a lot of potential for growth, you know, uh, massive potential for growth, but it's not a one one way street. Uh, even that very limited state capacity can go down. You know, the obvious shadow case here is Somalia, where the state just disintegrated in the 1990s. In many ways, a very, sim very similar place, the same climate, uh, very similar eth ethnic groups, the Somalis who speak uh, the same, a very similar language to the Burana, uh, similar livelihoods, uh, pastoralism, nomadism, um, and, and, and so on. And then the weak state did not invest in state capacity, that state capacity simply ceased to uh, exist with the consequences that we are all familiar with, which points to some of the stakes um, involved in this process. Although the reason why I'm so interested in it is uh, that looking at state capacity development, even in places starting from, well, in places, even in places starting from such a low absolute level nonetheless uh, provide us provides us with useful information about how state capacity development happens more generally including how it unfolded way back when in other places for example in Europe for which we do not have any direct empirical data and have historic have always relied on historical archival information. And here we have a somewhat analogous process and one that we can directly observe, which I think can be very useful to scholars of state building and those interested in state building and state capacity, which is a lot of us. Yeah. Yeah, we had a colleague before, um, uh, he was from Kenya, Muita. And when I told him about this, he was like, what? How can Kenya be in the most fragile state? So he was uh, also very surprised and a, a bit upset. <laughs> See that? He did not agree. Yeah, that, yeah def de definitely not. Um, it is, a, you know, the indicators, you know, show what they show, what you see, what you see, see on the slide, but it is, relatively stable uh, state, that's for sure, even if it faces risks, for example, from uh, you know, Al-Shabaab and uh, the situation across the border in, in, uh, in Somalia. 
All right, so we've reached our time limit. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to our presenter and to for all of our attendees. Thanks for participating. Um, so stay tuned for our next present. Actually, our next uh, faculty uh, talk will be in January. We'll take uh, this December off because of you know grading with the finals and then holiday breaks. So we'll we'll come back together in January with some new speakers, and I'll send that information out. Uh, a little bit later. So, Great. well, thank you for having me and thank you for organizing, Brian. Yep. Well, good Thanks. to see everyone. Take good care. Project. Very interesting. All right. Yep. Thank you. Take care. Good to, good to see everyone. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. And thank you, Darren. Thank you for your very warm words. Nice. Darren is one of my students. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah, we had only two students, I think. Two students. Wow. Always good, good, good to see them. So thank you, Darren. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bye, bye. Okay. Oh, bye. Brian, right. you, Take uh, care, everyone. Bye. What's that? Oh, it's still recording though. <laughs> Here, I'll I'll hit the uh, the off button. Here you go.